Good evening and welcome to this evening's full council meeting. I would first of all like to move to agenda item one, which is welcome and safety information. Again, welcome to today's full council meeting. Welcome also to members of the public who are watching this meeting via our YouTube channel. Councillors, please be mindful of the etiquette guidance that has been issued, which will ensure that you can be viewed and understood by members of the public watching at home. May I please remind everyone to behave with due courtesy, tolerance and respect for one another one another's conduct and conduct oneself in a reasonable way. There are two methods of voting at this meeting. For some votes, I will ask, can I take that this is agreed and wait for any responses? I will then ask if anyone wishes to vote against. Councillors should only indicate if they do not agree. For other votes, a named vote will, be, will take place by way of a roll call. Councillors have been provided with guidance on how to help the roll call take place as smoothly as possible. Now, I would like to move to the agenda. I'd now like to move to agenda item two, apologies for absence. I have received apologies from the following councillors, Councillor English, Councillor Mead, and Councillor Abraham. Are there any other apologies? Okay, thank you. I would now like to move to agenda item three, declarations of interest. Can I please ask whether any councillors have any interest to declare regarding the items on today's agenda? Thank you very much. I'd now like to move to agenda item yeah, four. Can you go on mute if you haven't, if you're not speaking intentionally, please? Thank you. I'd now like to move to agenda item four, minutes of the previous meeting. Firstly, I move the minutes of the meeting of the council held on the 8th of December, 2020, as a correct record. Do I have a seconder? Seconded, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Can I take that the, mess, um, the minutes are agreed? Thank you. Um, I now move to agenda item five, which is Lord Mayor's business. I would just quickly like to um, make a, a plug for the Lord Mayor's medals. You probably can't see that, but I have a Lord Mayor's medal here. Applications will be closing on Friday, the 22nd of January. And I would like to urge members of the public uh, as long as, and along with the councillors, if you have an individual, a group, or an organization that you know of who have gone the extra mile in over the COVID period to help people in Bristol with issues re related to COVID. If you'd like to put in an application, we would uh, be very grateful and we would welcome those applications. The application form can be found on Bristol City Council website. And if you go to the Lord Mayor's page, you should, uh, you should be able to find it there. Thank you. I would now like to move to agenda item six, public forum. 30 minutes is allowed for this item. Details of petitions, statements and questions received have been published on our website. Members of the public who have registered to speak have been invited to watch on YouTube and enter the waiting room for this meeting. I will, will outline the following for them. You will be permitted to enter the meeting from the waiting room and you will be put on mute initially. You may be in the waiting room for a little time before your, your turn, so please be patient. I will call out your name at which point you can unmute yourself. If the person has not joined the meeting or there are technical problems, 
admitting people to the meeting, we will move on to the next person and seek to return afterwards if the person becomes available. When the exchange is finished, you will leave the meeting and the next person will be called. If you have a further public forum, you will remain and are asked to remain on mute. In the event of any disruption, I will give two warnings before that person is removed from the meeting so that the meeting can continue. Firstly, public petitions. There were no public petitions received under public forum for this meeting. So I'd next like to move to public statements that have been received. There were a total of six public statements received. A list will be displayed on the screen now. Two members of the public indicated that they wish to speak to their statements. <coughs> These are indicated on, on the list on the screen and we will run through these in order. I will invite each person to speak to their statement for one minute. Please do summarize and please bear in mind that all statements were sent to councillors in advance of this meeting. I'd first like to move to public statement number one. Andrew Varney, you have one minute to speak. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, congratulations to the Mayor on being named Politician of the Year in the Business Green Leaders Awards for, and I quote, the politician who has done the most to advance the cause of the green economy in the past year. However, it's possible when they were handing out the award, they didn't know about the Mayor's plan to build a road through a densely populated residential area, leading to more traffic, more congestion, more pollution, and the loss of a vital wildlife corridor. The old Brisington railway line has become a haven for wildlife over the last 60 years, with at least seven mammal species, three reptile species, and 33 bird species. All of this biodiversity will be lost if the Labour road goes ahead, but will be protected if the Liberal Democrat plan for an active travel corridor prevails instead. The road scheme left. makes a mockery of the Mayor's state's intent to create a green, nature-rich city. If it goes ahead, the Mayor should hand back his green award because he clearly doesn't deserve it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would now like to move on to public statement two. That's David Redgewell. You have one minute to speak to your statement, David. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Um, yes, I'd like to raise the issue of the budget again, as always, and remind everybody about public bus services. Whilst the government is funding the majority of the buses now through COVID-19 uh, bus operator grant to the tune of £27.5 million a week, that will not remain indefinitely. And the issue is also about the Bristol City Council contribution for supported bus services in East Bristol, North Bristol and South Bristol, which are very important, including in Brislington. Um, where we need to make sure that we passport budget contribution to WECA and the West Kingdom Public Transport Authority. Secondly, uh, Mayor, I'm very concerned that we make sure Bristol's a big regional player. It needs to play its role in making sure not only do we get North Somerset into WECA as soon as we possibly can, but importantly, we show leadership in uh, regional bodies. And I believe want to the Mayor's left. attention the need to reform the Western Gateway Transport Board. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. We will move now to the public questions received. Please note that the questions have been published on the website and are shared on the screen now. 10 members of the public have submitted questions and six have indicated that they wish to attend the meeting. These are indicated on the list and we will run through them in order. Each participant is asked to read their question out and the mayor will reply verbally. Following the mayor's response, the participant can ask a supplementary question. Please ask your questions to the mayor. I'd like to first move to question one, William Mountford. Would you like to ask your question to the mayor, please? 
Thank you for having me. And uh, seeing as these questions were submitted on the 18th of November, I'm glad that nothing has changed since. With the announcement from the government to halt the sale of petrol and diesel cars by 2030, I'm asking if the mayor and this council will commit to implementing overhauls of Bristol's streets and public transport in time for this deadline so that all residents have either access to an electric car charging station for their private vehicle or to adequate bus or train transport connections for public vehicles. Mayor, you're on mute still, I'm afraid. Sorry about that, I clicked on the wrong button. So, uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, you know, we welcome the announcement from government. Um, we'd already committed to carbon neutrality by 2030 um, as, uh, you know, as well. Um, I would just say though about the question though, we, uh, you know, are planning for the future of the city has to take account of the possibility or the, the high likelihood that things will change anyway. So we anticipate batteries becoming uh, more efficient as time goes on, um, uh, lasting longer. So uh, we've got to take into account, we got to take that into account as we think about the future infrastructure that we are putting on across the city. But having said that, I'll, I'll make you uh, share a few things that, um, uh, that are offers to you as well. Uh, one is what we have set up in Bristol to plan for that future is the Bristol One City Plan and the One City Approach, which is not a plan that stays stagnant, but it is one that is in constant uh, review and refresh. It sets out a whole range of, of, of outcomes that we want to uh, deliver up to the year 2050. You'd be more than welcome to look at the transport board element um, within that and well, and any other element you want, but certainly on transport and connectivity, um, uh, co-chaired by Councillor Kai Dudd, um, and to input uh, to that. You'll find within that plan, you will see the commitments to a mass transit system, a bus deal, our clean air, modal shift as well, away from private cars to um, active travel and public transport, a ring of park and rides, reduction of uh, road injuries and, and journeys, digital connectivity as well that will reduce uh, the need for people to, to move around uh, so much uh, as well. What you'll also find is that we, what we're planning for is the interaction between transport and other elements within the plan. For example, housing, where we put homes will be a big determinant on, on the transport needs as well. So again, that, that's open to you. Um, I'd say too, you can look at what we are doing in terms of, the, I think the scale of ambition we've put in place for transport is bigger than the cities ever had before. I think for the past decades, we've had a patch and mend approach to transport uh, by bringing through the mass transit system and the uh, bus strategy, uh, the bus deal, uh, you know, as part of an integrated transport network uh, you know, we, we're offering a real chapter change in the way we do it. Um, and in terms of getting the investment in that infrastructure, we've been pressing government to front load investment in green infrastructure as part of our economic renewal, decarbonize, um, to decarbonize our economic uh, recovery and activity. Uh, and that will include EV charging points as part of that, of that offer, but it will include a lot more, including the mass transit. Uh, we are putting EV charging points around. They're in our public parks, Eastfield Park, uh, for example, and the private sector is also uh, bringing forward uh, more parts, uh, more uh, points. Council can't uh, do it alone. And um, just as a, an aside, a bit in there, I thought I'd take the opportunity to share with you. Um, we've put the SDGs at the heart of what we do as well. So you have a chance to draw on that uh, to inform your participation. Um, and we just had a presentation yesterday to the multi board of the city partnership from the Bristol Advisory Committee on Climate Change. We're really driving in how we get that shift in the way we move around as well. And I know Kai is following up with them for some more specific advice. So, so I totally take the premise, you know, the, the spirit of your question, lots going on, and uh, you'd be more than welcome to, to outreach to us and, and put your ideas into the mix as well. William, do you have a supplementary to your first question? Only the second question. Okay, that's fine. So if we'd like to move on to your second question, if you'd like to ask that of the mayor, please. Thank you. Thank you, and it does touch on the issue that you raised of where houses are going. St Paul's, where I live, is the site of numerous housing developments with little apparent development of supporting facilities or infrastructure, such as parking, doctors, or even green space that's being built on top of. On top of this, the entire region exists in an area of constant illegal air pollution. So I'm asking if this council and the mayor will will commit to prohibit the development of residential spaces on roads where living in the property would pose a health hazard to the people inside of it. So it is, I mean, the perceptions of St. Paul's have changed wildly. I remember the days when people were terrified to uh, go there when I was a kid, but I guess it's become very fashionable now. 
Um, I think we, as particularly as city leaders, and I, I understand you aspire to be one uh, yourself, it's really important that we're very careful of the way we uh, talk about some of the city's challenges. If you're talking about constant illegal air, um, air quality levels, that's not necessarily as accurate um, uh, you know, as, as we would like. It can be quite alarmist. That's not to take away from the challenge of clean air, uh, but we've got to look at the way air quality is measured uh, around the city on a, a, a specific number of of key streets, and then that is taken as our our clean air quality. So we do have to be, you know, just a little bit careful, um, uh, you know, on being uh, on the way we um, describe it. Um, but there's there's something else that goes into your question, which is about housing delivery. Um, we we have to deliver on a number of fronts at the same time. Uh, we do need to uh, deliver homes for people. Uh, we are, but from the beginning. Uh, it, you know, if the suggestion is that homes are coming through without any immunity to support people, again, that's got to be careful of the way we um, uh, the way we talk about that. We have not just committed to building units and numbers of homes. We've committed to building communities, um, and in our housing developments, we uh, we have uh, aligned them up to the SDGs. We're building biodiversity into those schemes as they come through. We're building sustainability into them. We're trying to build them in active travel um, areas as well. Um, so we do need to build homes. So again, as I, I shared with Councillor Quarterly um, earlier on, if at any time you're going to oppose house building, and, and I was on the Archbishop of Canterbury's Housing Commission call today, and we're talking about the urgency of the housing crisis, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take the challenge on housing delivery, but then you do need to step up and start saying, well, where are you going to put the housing? Because the crisis is not going away. Um, and what we can't afford to do is have everyone just opposing house building when we start building housing, we we have the crisis, which is a crisis in St. Paul's, as is a crisis of gentrification, um, I would um, add to uh, uh, as well. Um, so that's really important. It'd be great if um, if you contributed some ideas on increasing densification, um, more building in the center of the city with inactive travel areas that reduces dependency on, our, you know, on our transport networks as well. It's also important to understand that building homes generates income for the uh, for the council, certainly through council tax and sale as well, uh, which allows us to, to invest money in other areas that are financially uh, stretched as well. So housing is an issue of social justice, uh, but done well, it'll be done with, uh, with a regard to biodiversity, uh, mixed, balanced, sustainable uh, communities, but also the financial coffers of, of Bristol City Council. So oppose, yes, you know, make the case, but turn up with some solutions as well. I'd really welcome that. Thank you. William, do you have a supplementary question to your second question you asked the Mayor? Not at this time. Thank you very much indeed. Um, PQ03, Matt Gibbs has not um, been able to attend, so I'll now move on to PQ07, which is Rob Breyer. If you'd like to ask your question of the, ma the Mayor, please, Rob. Uh, it's quite a long question. Do you want me to read the whole thing out? Uh, I think you need, if you can abbreviate it slightly um, and just ask your question of the mayor, maybe condensing it if you're able. Okay, so it's actually addressed to Councillor Kai Dudd. Is that who I'm addressing it to or is it to the mayor? These are questions to the mayor. Um, but okay. the cabinet member may, it may be more appropriate for the cabinet member to respond in this instance. OK, well, I'll, I'll, whoever it's going to go to, um, um, just to summarise the question, it's about the fact that in residence parking zones, um, you're able to apply to park a car outside your house. But there isn't a process in Bristol for applying to use public space on the public highway for other community orientated uses, for instance, uh, small community parks or um, cycle storage. Um, that we do have some cycle storage, but there isn't a process set up for residents to use it. So my question is, would, uh, well, it was actually addressed to Kai Dud, <laughs> would he be willing to meet with me to talk uh, through that and uh, talk about how we can set up a process for people to take more ownership of their spaces? Yeah, if, uh, if the mayor's obviously happy for me to answer. Um, yeah, no, more, more than happy to meet you to, dis to uh, discuss this. Um, there is actually some policy in place around suspending parking bays at the moment, but I don't think it would be sort of appropriate to this scenario. So I think it's probably worth having a discussion around this just to see what, what we can do. But I, I do sort of respect the sort of uh, general aims that you've got, got with this really. So um, let's have a meeting and discuss what we can, uh, what we can come up with. 
Rob, do you have a supplementary question for either the mayor or for Councillor Dad? Yeah, just thank you for the, yeah, just a quick one. Uh, thank you very much, Kai, for that answer. And um, yeah, just, just let me know how to be in contact with you. And if you could contact me, presumably you'll pass on my contact details through this. But um, yeah, it'd be great to meet. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Rob, I believe you've got to rush off because I think you've got other pressing matters. <laughs> so um, Maybe, who knows? Yeah, good luck anyway. Um, I Thanks. understand your wife is expecting a baby today, so um, yeah. <laughs> good luck with that anyway. Thank you. I'd now like to move to PQ08. Andrew Varney, if you'd like to ask your question to the Mayor, please. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, so my first question is about the e-scooter trial, which, which has been billed as a low carbon alternative form of transport to get around Bristol. Unfortunately, you can only use them in the city centre, so they are unlikely to encourage the vast majority of Bristolians, uh, Bristolians sorry, to change their travelling habits. To really make a difference, they need to be available at our park and ride sites and other key suburban locations so that people have a real choice in how they travel. Would the mayor be able to investigate the possibility of extending the coverage of the scheme? I understand it has recently been extended, but uh, uh, further extending it and reporting back on his findings, because as it stands, it's a missed opportunity and the e-scooters are likely to end up as nothing more than a novelty for tourists. Uh, so um, it's a trial. Um, and uh, by definition, with a trial, you start with a smaller area and begin expanding it out. And that's what we're in a process of you know, doing. It will, it will get bigger um, through time. So I'm, I'm sure it will stress to the out, outer lying areas as well. Andrew, do you have a supplementary question for the mayor? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I've also seen e-scooters abandoned in the middle of pavements causing a potential danger to the visually impaired. Does the mayor agree with me that there should be a designated parking bay, perhaps alongside bus stops, where e-scooters could be left without clutching the pavements and causing a potential accident? And this is perhaps more import a more important issue if the scheme does expand and more e-scooters are on our streets. So there are designated parking spaces for the e-scooters. You can only leave them in certain places. Mm -hmm. No, I've um, seen them abandoned in middle of pavements in all sorts of strange locations. Okay, maybe, yeah, well, we've, we've had pretty good reports on the police, but on the point is, should there be designated parking spaces? There are. Have you used the scheme? Uh, no, not yet, because I live in Brisington and it doesn't come okay. to my area, so it's pointless, I prefer to cycle. Oh, right. it, doesn't, it, it doesn't reach my house either, but I, I, I used, I've used them a few times now. Uh, when you actually want to drop them off, you can't drop them off just anywhere. On the the map, will only allow you to check out of the scooter scheme if you drop it in a designated parking space, and it and it asks the uh, users to take a photo of the scooter to prove they've left it in that space and in reasonable uh, condition. So I, 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 you know, if there are scooters led around, which you know, I'll I'll take you at your word, then I guess people may have gone and taken those scooters and then carried them somewhere and, and left them lying around because if you rent them you can only unrent them as it were um, when you've parked them and taken a photo and send it in uh, to the company but there are parking spaces and the scheme is expanding thank you thank you do you have a supplementary question to your second question andrew uh, so I haven't asked, uh, if I ask my second question now, Lord Mayor, so um, question two is about um, motorway through traffic. So the Mayor may be aware that road signs on Callington Road currently advise drivers heading for the M4 motorway to travel into the city along the A4 through the densely populated suburb of Brisbane West, where congestion and pollution is already a serious issue. I'm sure the mayor would agree with me that it would be more sensible to encourage this motorway bound traffic to head out of the city and onto the ring road instead. That is, after all, the purpose of ring roads. Could the mayor say if and when the road signs will be changed? Uh, so that, that, that signage will be looked at as part of the, the, the plans on the, for our uh, clean air zone uh, work um, and, and all the work we've done on air quality. But I agree. If I was going to if I was going to the M4 and I was there, I would turn right, not left, go around the ring road. So we had a look at the signage today as well. But it will be reviewed. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have yeah. a supplementary to your second question, Andrew? 
Well, yes, I talked earlier about um, the Callington Road Link plan and the congestion and the pollution, the deterioration in air quality that's going to cause. And even some of the local Labour councillors and candidates are now supporting the Liberal Democrat Greenway proposal. Why is the mayor persisting with a road scheme that will cause so much damage to our environment? Yeah, I, I know there's been, a, a, you know, a lot of noise that we're, we're looking at all the options available to us to, to uh, reduce dependency on uh, to improve air quality and produce, improve journey time in the city. Uh, fundamentally, uh, though, uh, behind uh, behind what we're doing, as I shared it with the green uh, candidates um, earlier on, is is a really transformational chapter change approach to public transport, which includes the mass transit system and the bus deal, which gives people a viable alternative to private cars not just improving air quality, but in improving congestion, uh, you know, as well. And that's, that's the, you know, the angles uh, we're, we're pursuing to try and give people, uh, well, and obviously we've, we've done lots of work around um, widening pavements, cycle lanes, um, active travel um, in general. Yes, but building more roads isn't going to encourage people to get out there. Hang, hang on, hang on, hang on a minute. I think you might have already asked your supplementary question. I have, Lord Mayor, I apologise. Thank you very much. That's okay. Thank you. I would now like to move to David Redgewall. If you'd like to ask your first question, PQ 10 to the mayor, please. David, I think you might be on mute at the moment. David, you're still on mute. Sorry, okay. can you hear me now? Uh, we mayor. can, yeah. Yeah, my first question is about bus revenue support. Obviously, uh, and rail revenue support. Um, Bristol Council used to bus revenue support directly to supported uh, networks in South Bristol, Brislington, and around uh, Knoll and around the south of the city, and also to East Bristol and to the important network around North Bristol. These are all supported networks serving hard to reach, socially excluded estates. Uh, this has now gone to Wecker, and I'm just very concerned that we have, one, uh, put a budget through to Wecker to cover these services, and two, they maintain them, even though at the moment we also got COVID-19 bus operator grant from the DFT. So it's just an assurance, really, and also that we get uh, money for revenue support for local rail services, Westbury to Seven Beach in particular. It's an interesting point, Dave, because because um, in the conversations we've had about the potential expansion of the combined authority, one of the points we've made is that one is it needs to make financial sense, but also we've wanted safeguarding in the governance arrangements to make sure that Bristol's interests, the interests of Bristol's communities and our transport needs are, are respected and prioritised uh, within the combined authority. And to be perfectly frank, and I'm sure you've been in some of those meetings where uh, one or two of our neighbours have uh, have questioned uh, Bristol's, you know, the need to, to tackle uh, some of Bristol's challenges. And we want to safeguard against that before we had three rural um, authorities uh, um, challenging the interests um, of uh, Bristol. So, yeah, I mean, the money, as I said, the, the authority, as it was, transferred into the combined authority, and that's the means we uh, work through, and we continue uh, to uh, to make our case and make sure that um, our, our needs are understood and the particular needs of some of the most disadvantaged communities who were hit not just by financial disadvantage, but then transport poverty um, also are are upheld and subsidised. And look, let's be real about it. I, I received a, a kind of a subtle uh, warning the other day that if we press too hard on one particular Bristol issue, then the issue of um, rural transport would be put into the mix to compete against our issue of city uh, transport uh, uh, poverty. Hence the need again to make sure that the governance respects the, the need of you know of, of cities and we're not drowned out by that by that voice but we'll do, we'll keep pressing um dave as you know we, we see transport as one of the the flagship challenges um of the moment david do you have a supplementary question to your first question to the mayor yeah i think the answer may be we, when we eventually sort the north semester issue out with a second devo deal is to make sure that weka has adequate precepting powers to maintain the bus services like andy burnham does and Andy Streets and Steve Rotherham do in other city regions. But the yeah. mayor look at that issue. Yeah, sure. But we we have to be we have to be certain though, and remembering there are there are some realities here. The rural urban difference, the party political difference, and I don't mean they we are a different kind of culture in terms of a, a city that within all that, the interests of a progressive 
um, urban city in the middle of a very rural um, um, hinterland that, that the interests of the city are one, understood, and two, upheld and prioritized, irrespective of what goes on uh, with, uh, with the uh, precept. That, that should be a priority for all the councillors um, elected to work for the interests of, of, of Bristol. And, and that's one of the reasons we, we say that the governance of the combined authority, getting that governance right, is so important. I mean, look, they, you've been around long enough. You'll know these internal uh, competitions that, that take place that we need to safeguard the city's interests um, in the face of. Thank you. David, would you like to ask your second question to the Mayor, please? I suppose my second question is always, I've always believed that Bristol's a regional capital in South West England, uh, one of two, probably Plymouth and uh, Exeter and Bristol, three maybe. Um, and therefore, I'm always concerned about regional governance. And I again look at our Northern Mayors and our West, uh, West Midlands Mayor and see the influence they have well outside their boundaries, um, including the, the City Mayor in Liverpool, uh, to make sure that those regions have a really good hard voice. I'm aware of the work that's going on with the Western Gateway partnership uh, with Swindon and, and Wiltshire and Gloucestershire. I am more concerned though about seeing the outputs of the Western Gateway Transport Board. Uh, although it's now run from Wecker, it's very much, as the Mayor describes, a rural authority. And I am concerned about the level of road building going on in that, that proposals in that organisation. David, so David, can I just point out to you, I'm looking at your question, PQ11, and what you're actually saying now sounds more like a supplementary question, and I think we'll take it as that. OK, okay. yeah, it was about regional government. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Just trying to clarify two boards, Lord Mayor, two of them. Uh, is, is it about my approach to regional governance, Dave? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying okay. to identify, I tried to point out the two different boards. That's why I was, didn't want to get confused. Right. Let's deal with them. Yeah. So we, we're committed to the join-up. Remember, it's Bristol, Cardiff and Newport at the centre of launching the Western Gateway and then in, uh, inviting the, 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 the neighbouring authorities around us to get involved in a regional approach, thinking about how we decarbonise the economy, deliver on housing and, and take on the transport challenge as a wider... Um, economic footprint area. The number of commutes between Bristol and Cardiff is bigger than the number of commutes between uh, Manchester and Leeds every day. You know, how do we how do we service that transport without people jumping in their cars, coming off a bridge they no longer have to pay for, and uh, and so forth. So we've we've absolutely tried to uh, take that regional approach. But there's a dilemma facing us um, in the combined authority area, which is perfectly it's just there, is that we are we are the only city authority. Everyone else is tagged, and we know, and we have to tread this line very carefully. Um, that there is a debate about cities and towns and villages that goes on, and there have been tensions historical. Some people have been in the council long enough to have been at the heart of those debates between the interests of the city and the interests of rural areas. And if the if if the combined authority political leader is elected by the surrounding rural areas, and their mandate is rural areas. And there were statements made before the last election, which are basically amounting to, don't worry, I'll clip Bristol's wings, I'll, I'll manage Bristol's uh, growth and development. Um, then we have to be aware of that, right? And as you said too, there can be a tendency, and actually some of these conversations have come up in the Western Gateway, where some of the partners have wanted to come into the Western Gateway because they wanted money for their road programmes, whereas our, our, because that's the way they've connected their rural areas. Our priority has been urban, mass public transport um, offer, decarbonised mass transit offer. So we just have to be real about it. Those uh, are some of the tensions in getting a regional, you know, a regional approach, well, together, which, is, which is why it's so important uh, that we that we get the governance right for any regional um, arrangement uh, that we go into so that the interests of our city, which are, which will be unique within a rural area, are, are, um, are, are understood and, um, you know, accepted as important. Thank you very much. I'd now like to move to PQ14. Catherine Grant, if you'd like to ask your question to the Mayor, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Yes, um, I have a question uh, for the Mayor concerning the Mardike steps um, that descend from uh, Cliftonwood to the Hotwell Road. This question was posed at the la in December at the full council. So I don't know whether I should repeat the question or if I should just move straight to the secondary question because there has been an answer given, um, which would be best. 
If you feel satisfied with the response that you've received thus far and you would like to move to a supplementary question, that would be absolutely fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is what I'd like to do because a, a, an answer was given to the issue of the prolonged closure of these steps um, and the fact that for more than 12 months now, residents of Cliftonwood and beyond, um, Clifton and, and anybody really coming down through that ward, that access has been closed. And, and this is at a time where it's most needed, where people really are being asked to take this particular type of exercise and be outside in a particular type of way. But more generally, um, it is impeding our shift towards you know, walking and, and livable neighborhoods and um, these opportunities for safe pedestrian use um, of, of these Mardike steps, much loved. So my supplementary question is, we've had an answer that there is a complication because the wall that has collapsed is privately owned and the council has to uh, engage with that owner in order to, to sh cost share the repair. But I just think that many residents in the area feel it would be a reasonable risk Catherine, for the council. Really would, Catherine, can I ask you to get to, to your supplementary question, Sorry, please? I'm on it now, yeah, yeah. Thank you. The supplementary question is, would it not be a reasonable risk for the council to go ahead and make the needed repair, despite the fact that the uh, wall is privately owned, and to then recover costs from that owner after the event, thus allowing the public not to be the one carrying the sort of burden of, uh, of this very, very delayed uh, highway closure. Okay, so um, there are a number of elements to this. Uh, one is we are in a legal dispute um, and the local authority is not above the law. Um, and that legal dispute is, is prolonged, unfortunately. We wish we could resolve it, but we have to, Go in line with the. We have to go in line with the, the legal process. Secondly, if we were to take, if we were to take um, to start work on the wall, we'd be open to being sued ourselves, which is a huge risk uh, with council taxpayers' uh, money. There'd be no guarantee that we would get the money back that maybe we shouldn't have spent in the first place. So that's that, you know that's uh, that's a, a a big risk uh, to the um, authority as well. We don't know where that would end up. But we have to we have we have to operate in line with the the law. We can't override uh, questions of ownership, you know, of the wall. Unfortunately, I wish I wish we could have resolved it quickly, but it's just it's just the reality of the of the world we're in. Thank you very much indeed. That concludes questions received from members of the public. I would now look, like to move to agenda item seven: petitions notified by councillors. No council petitions have been received for this meeting. So I'd now like to move to agenda item eight, the audit committee half year report. Please may I ask Councillor Brain of the Labour Group to move this report. Please may I, um, uh, sorry, you have three minutes Councillor, thank you. Thank you my Lord Mayor. Um, this a uh, report from the uh, Audit Committee covers the period from May to September 2020. Uh, the 2018 to 19 accounts were not signed off until June 2020. Um, almost all councils have accounts signed off late these days due to government imposed timetables, but we had an added factor, and which was the Bristol energy controversy. This process led to, uh, to an access to information controversy in which elected members found themselves opposed to legal advice. Um, not sure that's been completely resolved yet. We've started to work on the 2019 to 20 accounts and that's a work in progress. Uh, the time spent on the 2018, 19 accounts has meant less time spent on other possible issues, which is a great shame, but we, but we had to prioritize what we did. The other issues we have looked at, at have been whistleblowing, um, send, uh, rates of compliance with internal audit recommendations. Internal audit have been engaged in a program of prepayment fraud testing of COVID-19 grants. The, the tests were selective, so as not to impede progress, uh, yeah, to the process. These grants are vital to the community, so it was considered more important to, um, to get the grants out and, and be selective about the, the, the uh, testing, testing. Internal audit has suspended its planned activity in the first quarter of the year. That was to allow uh, frontline services to focus on dealing 
with the pandemic, which was clearly of much greater importance. Um, not much more to say on this. It's a very short report. I'm sure others will have much to say. I'd like to thank Internal Audit for all their work, anti, the anti fraud team as well, um, Vice Chair Councillor Clive Stevens, all members of the Audit Committee, and a special mention goes to Tim Kemp and Chris Jackson for work they've done around the, um, the, the uh, struggle to get information to the committee. I thank them for that. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much indeed. May I ask Councillor Stevens to second the report? You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, as Vice Chair, I'm pleased to be able to explain to full council what I think is going on within your troubled audit committee. We are the primary means by which you gain assurance that the council's governance, risk, value and control systems are working. If not, there might be opportunities for cover-ups of bad or risky decisions, project overspends or worse. But our committee isn't allowed to do the checks, nor even see some exempt documents. We work through the chief internal auditor who can see all the documents if we're able to tell him where to look. If we are assured by him, then in turn we can assure you. With the council's companies, there's a third link in the chain. Their audit committee, they gain assurance, give it to us and we give assurance to you. This Byzantine system maybe worked okay until audit was given responsible responsibility for value for money arrangements in 2017. This was a national change, but in my view, it's brought a massive implication regarding access to information that's only just coming to light. Value for money inquiries are about holding the elected mayor to account on his decision making. Most other audit work is less confrontational. External auditors do the assessment if the cost to the taxpayer is material. In Bristol's case, over 18 million. There's plenty of big decisions that uh, go wrong and aren't that high. So the external auditors don't investigate. It's then a job for us and our internal auditors. But without access to all the facts, we can't define what we want checked. We have to half guess, and we have to interrogate officers who may have differing motivations or even instructions from above. It's a national issue made worse here due to Bristol's government's arrangements. In section three of the report, you can see there's some very careful wording trying to frame this as things the audit committee needs to improve on. But I say it's not us who needs to improve. One solution, which has cross-party support, is to release information to audit committee in the public interest. But we're told, no, it's not in the public interest. Clive, you have 30 seconds left. Thank you. So watch this space. I hope to see a Bristol Energy public interest report from our external auditors. It's over 18 million, you see. I'd like to thank our chair, Mark Brain, the rest of committee and officers for maintaining a sense of decorum while we're discovering this mess we've been putting. And to conclude, are any of you assured by this? Thank you very much. I would now like to call upon Councillor Radford to speak on behalf of the Conservative group. You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. This report is possibly one of the shortest members gets to review it full council. Yet it's incredibly important and I'm pleased Audit Committee now has a biannual opportunity to advise full council of their concerns rather than annually. Audit committees are the gatekeepers of organisations in terms of adequate and effective risk management, internal control and governance arrangements. To be effective, audit committee rely on the internal audit team to provide reports, findings and recommendations. Without an excellent internal audit team, the audit committee cannot carry out its role to be the eyes and ears for all members and help guard financial integrity. I would therefore like to thank our internal audit team for their continued hard work, reminding full council of the need to ensure that this team is fully supported and has a full complement of staff during non-pandemic times. Something which members of audit committee have been adamant about for many years, but something that hasn't been included in this report. 
The pandemic has obviously impacted on all departments in the council. Internal audit has been no exception. However, but as you can see, there has still been a substantial amount of focus work targeting areas that will not impact other departments at such a difficult time. Changing the audit work planning to quarterly will help audit committee have a more regular understanding and say in the changing prioritisation of work, which is a necessity in the current climate. The movement of responsibility for whistleblowing into the internal audit team last year should ensure audit committee have more regular updates and should give staff confidence in the council's whistleblowing procedures. Under governance issues, I'm pleased external auditors have been invited to produce a public interest report relating to Bristol Energy. I hope they take this offer up so that members have a clear understanding of how so many millions of pounds were lost and members can ensure future investment projects do not follow the same path. And I want to focus a little on the improvement areas that audit, audit committee confirmed are necessary at the end of last year. For audit committee to be effective, the information they ask for must be provided in a timely and accessible fashion. And there must be member trust in the information being given to them. Councillor, you have 30 seconds left. Thank you. Without this, audit committee is a tick box exercise for this council and none of us can be confident in its risk management controls. So, in summary, the Conservative group accept this report and support the Audit Committee with its identified improvement areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd now like to call upon Councillor Hans to speak on behalf of the Green Group. You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Hello there. Um, as previously agreed, previously agreed, I'm happy to endorse this report, but I'll be reserving my remarks. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and I'd like to call upon Councillor Kent to speak on behalf of the Liberal Democrat group. You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll, uh, I won't need that three minutes. Uh, I want to say thank you actually to the Chair of the Audit Committee, Mark Brain. I think he does a very fair job. And it's difficult. So we're looking at big, difficult issues sometimes. And having to leave our political opinions at the door can be tough for all of us. Uh, and he does a good job of, uh, I think, marshalling us all in the right direction, but also allowing debate. Um, I think as council, you should be worried about section three. I think you're getting uh, um, members of the audit committee from all parties say, we are concerned. We are concerned that we don't have the right to access information on your behalf. Uh, and end of the day, the audit committee is about making sure that we've spent our money well, and I think learning from mistakes. Uh, and we know there will always be mistakes, uh, and uh, the whole point is to not repeat them. Uh, so I hope members will go away and reflect and perhaps talk within their own groups how we can make sure audit is robust enough to deliver and, and has the information they need. Building trust is a worry that your audit members don't have full trust. And uh, I think that's something people need to reflect on. And also we do have concerns like some of the partner audit committees, some of them are very new. So uh, that, that, that is an issue that they've not fully established, but we're, we're putting substantial amounts of council money and resources into either companies we own or uh, working alongside external companies, making sure we've got robust audit arrangements is going to be essential for the future. So I hope I hope council members will just go away and reflect on that. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much. Uh, I will now be quiet. Thank you very much indeed. I'd now like to call upon Councillor Brain. Would you like to sum up as the mover of the report? You have a maximum of three minutes for that, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. I not much to say after that. I'm, I, I agree entirely with what Tim says about partner audit committees, and that's an, an area that we will need to be moving into soon. I'd like to thank Claire Radford for, for her kind and deserved praise uh, for the internal audit team. She did a much better job of that than I did. And I have to say, I agree with everything that Clive, Tim, and Claire have said on information access. It's 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 been obvious that on on the audit committee. Um, Councillors of all parties are of one mind on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. The recommendation will now be shared on the screen. 
The recommendation is for the Council to accept the report of the Audit Committee and note the key areas outline, as outlined on the screen and in the agenda online. Now that you have been able to view the recommendations, I will move to the vote. Can I take it that it is agreed? Are there any votes against? If you could please indicate if you are voting against. There are no uh, votes against, so the um, the uh, paper is uh, accepted by all council. Thank you very much. And that concludes agenda item eight. I'd now like to move to agenda item nine, the corporate, in, corporate parenting strategy refresh 2021 to 2023. Please may I ask Councillor Godwin of the Labour Group to move the report, which is for noting. I understand as part of your speech, you are also joined by Ryan and Ashton, who are going to assist you. And that also we have Stacey on a video ready to share when, when prompted. Yeah, so um, I think... There, oh, there, oh, there is a second video. Sorry, sorry, Helen, I know you're anxious to speak. Sorry. Um, there is a second video that we will share via email with all councillors and the link added to our broadcast to the public. I would like to welcome, a special welcome to Ryan and Ashton. Um, and would you like to go ahead now, please, Councillor Godwin? Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Sorry for, for being okay. so key. Um, I think probably the best thing to do is for is if we hear from Ryan and Ashton, first of all, and then if it's then possible to play the video and then I'll speak after that, if that's all right. That's absolutely fine. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, who's going first, Ryan? Is it you or Ashton? This is me. Uh, it's me, I think. Okay, do you want to go for it when you're ready? Yeah. Dear corporate parents, we are children. We just happen to be in care. We don't want to be stereotyped and we don't want special treatment. Please don't, please don't make assumptions about us. What you need to know is we are all different and you can't put us all in one category. We would like your help and support. Thank you, Ryan. Thank Ashton, you. are you there? I can't see you, Ashton. Chris, is uh, he there? Oh, here we go. Hi, Ashton. Hello. You okay? I'm back. Yeah. Fab, do you want to go ahead? Um, okay. Uh, what we want for our future is help to get the education that we want and for you to have a high expectation for us. Help us get the right housing when we need it. Help us to uh, get work experience, jobs, and help us to find out what we can do. And have opportunities to access activities and meet other people. Uh, we will know you have taken our views if you ask questions to understand us, stay in touch with us and tell us what you are doing about our views, children in care council. Thank you, Ashton. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you Ashton. That's brilliant. Thank you. And thank you so much, Ryan, as well. Lovely to see you. Um, okay, and then I think if we can play the video as well, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Dear corporate parents, we are Bristol Care Leavers. We would like to be heard and valued. We want to have a voice. We are all unique in our own different ways. We may have similar paths, but we have different approaches. 
to reaching our similar goal to be successful in life. We need to be generally supported like a family. We would, we would need you to care about us as individual people and to show us that you care not just because you're paid to do so. We might need second chances, which other young people would get automatically. We need positive reinforcement. Please build us up. We might need a helping hand to achieve and thrive. From Care Leavers United Bristol. Brilliant. Okay, so you've heard from um, Ryan, Ashton and Stacey and um, as is usual at this um, annual item, our young people have said everything better than I ever could. So thank you so much, guys. You are really wonderful. Um, this corporate parenting strategy refresh belongs to our care experienced young people. It's been proudly co-designed with children in care and care leavers. And it is a document to guide the council and our partners to ensure that we continue to build on our work in corporate parenting. And most importantly, we carry on in our endeavour to improve the services and experiences and outcomes of our children in care and care leavers. This is the fourth time that I've brought this item to full council. And I really do believe that each year we have moved forward as corporate parents, both as a council and as a city in the way that we respond to and look after our care experienced young people. But there is much, much more to do. We need to focus on mental health, on education, on housing and on career opportunities. Young people with experience of care are less likely to thrive in those areas. And until this isn't the case, we cannot stop our relentless focus on improving our services, both as a council but also our health service, our schools, our housing providers, and as employers. Members will notice uh, from the document that we focused on eight key priorities in this year's strategy. I won't go through them all because of time, but I did just want to focus on two areas, if I may. Firstly, housing. Too many of our care leavers are not in accommodation that would reach our collective standards. Our care leavers deserve to be in accommodation that's warm, that's secure and where they feel safe. We are asking ourselves some quite difficult questions to ensure that our move on accommodation for children who are 16 plus, and that includes some of our unaccompanied asylum seeking children, are as good as it should be and that work will continue on through this year. We've also included a priority for carers who look after our young people in the strategy. I cannot possibly make this speech today without acknowledging the amazing work of our foster carers during the pandemic. Many foster carers became teachers overnight, like so many of us, but also had to provide additional support to our young people for whom the pandemic triggered early trauma and also those who were unable to see their birth families during the, the lockdowns. All families have faced new challenges in the past 12 months, but our foster families and carers do deserve extra acknowledgement. And of course, we need to make sure that they also receive the support and the services that they need to be able to care for our young people. Finally, I would just like to draw members to page 63 of the strategy. It's a really beautiful illustration of how we see our system, how we want co corporate parenting to be. And just as love is at the heart of all our families and lives, it is absolutely at the heart of corporate parenting too. All of Bristol's children deserve love and importantly to feel loved. And I'm really proud that we have made this commitment today. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much indeed. And I would like to say a, a massive thank you to Ryan Ashton and also uh, the support worker who came along, Chris Gardner, and of course for the video that Stacey uh, took the time to make. I, it's always a very powerful um, uh, paper that comes to council and it's really important. I feel that we hear the voices of the young people. I think it adds real weight to the debate actually. So thank you very much, Ryan, particularly I can see you straight in front of me here. Thank you for taking the time and coming this evening. Thank you. I'd now like to move to the debate. I would now like to call upon Councillor Massey to speak on behalf of the Labour Group. You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And how can I follow that? It's really hard. I would like to pick up, though, on the comment that Ryan made 
We are children. We happen to be in care. We need you to care about us. And for me, that sentence is it all. It's so appropriate to this. All of you counsellors are corporate parents. And as corporate parents, we need to recognise and listen to the voice of our young people in care and support them on their journey towards a future independent life. This report recognises the challenges, including the financial pressure on the council, but underpins our commitment to maintaining provision and improving outcomes by working in collaboration with young people. Mental health is becoming a real concern for all the population in these difficult times, and we need to ensure that appropriate support is available for children who may have already experienced trauma in their lives. As chair of the Hope Virtual School, I recognise how important it is that the young people are helped to achieve good educational outcomes, and I'm very pleased to see this mentioned in the report. We should also recognise and support our foster carers, as well as thanking them and their families for the way they look after our children. One of the things I missed most this year during lockdown was not being able to attend the annual poetry competition, which brings adults and children together for the prize giving. And I do hope we can hold it again later this year. I really like the layout of this report. It's bright and attractive, and encourages, encourages you to read it, which I sincerely hope that all of you have already done or will do, as there are many learning points in there for all of us. Thank you again to everybody involved in producing it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'd now like to call upon Councillor Hiscock to speak on behalf of the Conservative group. You have three minutes, Councillor. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. I'm very happy to commend this refreshed corporate parenting strategy to members. It is often easy to overlook items on a packed agenda at full council that don't require a vote. But I hope that the brilliant input from Ryan and Ashton and Stacey has made it clear that our responsibility to young people in our care has never been more important. <clears throat> So after a year like no other, I think it is only right to start my response by extending a huge thank you to everyone involved in corporate parenting, our social workers, our educators in the Hope Virtual School, our youth service partners, and particularly our wonderful foster carers. All have gone the extra mile during the COVID pandemic and as a city, we are truly grateful for your commitment to protect our most vulnerable citizens. This strategy must not be seen as another glossy brochure full of well-meaning statements and sound bites. It must be a living document which helps to benchmark our service. Focus brings improvement. And this has been the case over recent years in health and education standards. But we need to expand our focus onto the SEND provision improvements, mental health access and care lever support. SEND EHCPs are improving and this is especially needed for our children in care. Thinking Aloud is a great mental health addition but from recent child case reviews, we can see st children are still falling through the gaps in the system. And supporting care leavers is still a cause for concern. Too many are still classed as neat. And I have seen in my own ward the damage done by neglecting vulnerable care leavers when placed in independent accommodation. I'm absolutely delighted that listening to the young person has been placed front and centre. It is surely the first place to start. Councilor, and the you have 30 seconds left. Yes. I commend the bravery in putting the first key message as the need for promoting love in the care system, including displays of physical affection. I know this is a minefield for social workers, 
but an absence of love is probably the worst deprivation any child can experience. There is much more that can be said, but I will con conclude. To make this a truly epic plan, there must be a continued drive. Can you draw to a close, please? Thank you. And accountability. And this need is summed up by one child's short but honest plea. Please keep your promises. And if we do that... Claire, can you, can you really draw to a close, please? Thank you. Done. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd now like to call upon Councillor Comley to speak on behalf of the Green Group. You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And thank you to Ryan, Ashton and Stacey for your contribution this evening. You always make the rest of us look like amateurs. So um, thank you. I think we can rightly judge a society, a country, a city on how well it cares for those who need it most. Taking a child into the care of a local authority is not a decision that is taken lightly. And it is a clear sign that someone is in need of support and protection. So how good is the care given to those children? Nationally, care experienced young people are three times more likely to be out of education, training or employment than the average for their age. Around a quarter go from care to homelessness at 18. Clearly, we are not doing very well as a country at giving young people the care and support they need to thrive. So can we do better here as a city? This strategy refresh is part of the process of trying. And I love that the first thing that greets you is the voices of care experienced children and young people speaking for themselves about what they want and need from us. Nothing about us without us is a good principle to aim for in planning services. And as a regular on the corporate parenting panel, I've been really impressed by the willingness of senior officers to not only consult young people, but to be held accountable by them, to take away the concerns they raise, make plans to address them, and then to report back what has been done and what progress has been made. That listening helps focus our efforts and we're seeing some promising signs. Support for families has helped to reduce the number of children coming into care. The percentage of children living with a foster family has increased. The percentage of children placed outside our area has fallen. And the percentage of care leavers in education, employment and training has risen. All indicators moving in the right direction. But there's still so much that needs to be done. The school system across the city really needs to address the issue of exclusions and overuse of alternative provision, not just for children in care, although they are disproportionately affected. Seriously, Council some of you school 30 leaders. seconds left. OK, thank you. Need to give you a heads a wobble. We need to prioritise recruiting and retaining social workers so that they can build those long, supportive relationships that are so important. And we need to continue recruiting foster carers, especially recruiting more diversely for the benefits that brings and so that we don't miss on those caring, loving homes that could be open to the children who need them. In all, I support this strategy refresh and look forward to working to see it delivered. Thank you. I'd now like to call upon Councillor Clough to speak on behalf of the Liberal Democrat group. You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Uh, I'll keep it short as I've been having never ending broadband issues. I'd like to thank Ryan and Ashton for attending the meeting this evening and Stacey for her video. You've been incredibly eloquent on your own and on others' behalves. I'd also like to thank the foster parents and social workers who over the course of what's been an incredibly difficult year have gone above and beyond what we've ever expected from them. It's been mentioned by the others and I think that they have to be congratulated on doing an amazing job. I hope to see the promise of our strategy attained over the next few years. And, I, and finally, I would encourage my colleagues to get involved in corporate parenting. We are all corporate parents and the more of us who participate in ensuring the goals that we've set for ourselves are reached, the better. Thank you. Thank you. 
That brings to the end of the debate. Councillor Godwin, would you like to respond? You have three minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, just really briefly, well, to thank Ryan and Ashton um, and Stacey again, and just to thank fellow members really for, um, I think we've tried really hard to have a, a kind of non-political approach to corporate parenting wherever possible. I don't think it particularly benefits um, our, our children for it to be um, an adversarial environment. So I'd just like to thank other members for, for all their work on, on corporate parenting. And I know that everyone is as committed as I am to, to taking this strategy forward. And I think it's just really important that we keep um, our, bar, our bar very, very high and we keep challenging ourselves around corporate parenting and we keep listening to Ryan and Ashton and Stacey and others and, and, and keep learning. So I look forward to doing that with everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. The recommendations will now be shared on the screen. The recommendation is for council to note the strategy and the progress on the delivery. Thank you. Council notes the report. That concludes agenda item nine. I would now like to move to agenda item 10, the annual report of local government and social care ombudsman decisions. I would like to move this report, which is for noting. I would now like to call Councillor Holland to speak on behalf of the Labour Group. You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And um, as you know, that this is a statutory report and one for noting, and it's one that's already been to audit committee, but that doesn't make it any the less important. And the report also, it's important to note that it covers the period ending March the 31st, 2020. So although these cases have been resolved now, it's never too late to look at the lessons learned. And the council is committed as a body, as we are hopefully all as individual members to being part of a learning organisation. So one of the things that I found very pleasing to read in the report or in the Ombudsman letter was that uh, council officers have been receiving training from the Ombudsman. I hope also that you've had a chance to click on the links to the Ombudsman website because actually it's very, very easy to use. It's great for making comparisons between ourselves and comparator authorities. But going to the Ombudsman, as members will know if they've ever supported a constituent taking that path, is an onerous process and can only be done when the stages of our own complaint system have been gone through. So for me, that reinforces the value of looking at these cases. And I'm glad that the council processes have been improved since the period covered by the, by the letter with the introduction of the I, I casework system, which has made complaint handling much more joined up and straightforward. You may also want to be reassured that cabinet members have our own reviews in place, tracking complaints in our departments following up actions, looking at learning points and the application of remedies. Now, as members will be aware from our own casework, sometimes issues that are raised are because residents, an issue has fallen through the net. Sometimes working through it highlights that's an inconsistency in policy or a gap in process. So the learning that we can have from these cases is all really significant. So I hope that members will join with me in welcoming the transparency and visibility that this report brings, but also recommit ourselves to being a learning organisation. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much indeed. I'd now like to call upon Councillor Weston to speak on behalf of the Conservative group. You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you very much, my Lord Mayor. Um, and thank you to Councillor Holland for moving this. Um, I have to say, I, I, I'm going to quote what uh, Councillor Hiscott was saying earlier on, which said there's a tendency when you're in a packed agenda to sort of skip through these middle reports that don't require an awful lot of voting. Um, I uh, spent a lot of time reading through this and I did click through the links. Uh, and actually this report um, is, is quite concerning. I, I take what Councillor Holm was saying about the extra training that's been going in, but it does raise several uh, errors that I think we as councillors need to be aware of 
and I think we need to make sure don't appear in next year's report. Uh, essentially, the upheld rate of complaints for, for Bristol is higher than the national average. The number of satisfactory responses is lower. Um, but what really is concerning, actually, is the information. Now, Councillor Holland spoke about the IT systems, and hopefully that will resolve it. But actually, if you look on, on the, uh, in, in the report that we've got before us um, on page, I think, two, when the ombudsman, sorry, then the letter from the ombudsman, talks about that they had to almost, uh, well, they had to uh, threaten us with witness summons in order to get information for incomplete responses. Uh, at no point should that be the case. Uh, we all believe in transparency. We believe that the cold light of day is, is, is the best thing to, to, to pro uh, provide truth. But actually to have to be threatened by the ombudsman is quite concerning. So the additional training that's gone in is very welcome. The IT system's going in, hopefully we'll do it. And that extra um, checks that Council Holm was talking about from cabinet uh, colleagues is more than welcome. But we're gonna to need to be looking at this very carefully next year to make sure we don't see this failure at IT and failure of process mean that actually we're failing the city. So this is quite concerning. I know we're, we're noting it. I know we're not voting on it, but actually I was very concerned to read the content of this Ombudsman's report. Thank you very much, my Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, I'd now like to call upon Councillor Stephen Clark to speak on behalf of the Green Group. You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, yeah, this uh, Ombudsman report looks at complaints received by the Council for the period ending the end of March 2020, so it doesn't include any of the pandemic-induced problems. Uh, as well as reading the report and looking at the website, I've had the benefit of watching the recording of the Audit Committee's discussion of this issue on 23rd of November, which included officers' comments, which were helpful. Um, the report we're looking at highlights 20-odd complaints that were upheld by the Ombudsman, or, or 20 complaints that were upheld by the Ombudsman. Now, this is a reasonably small number when put in the context of the 7,000 stage one complaints that were received during the period. But it does show an upward trend from the previous year where there were 12 upheld complaints. So we need to watch this going forward. Uh, brief details of the complaints are included in the report. And members will have seen they are largely generated by areas that could be expected to generate complaints, noise, refuge and housing. There are a number of complaints that are very worrying, however, um, not believing records of domestic abuse, for example. The one clear theme seems to be lost papers and slow responses to queries. Um, IT, is IT issues are often blamed, but as Councillor Holland has told us, there is now a new IT process in place which should improve the position going forward. One odd area that I would highlight, which, which Councillor Weston has also mentioned, is that the Ombudsman talks about delayed responses to investigation inquiries from his office. It seems that the council staff apparently lost or ignored letters and emails from the Ombudsman. Now, this issue was also raised the year before. Um, I would have thought that if you were an officer, one of whose cases was being investigated uh, through an Ombudsman, and that Ombudsman was going to write a report that would be in the public domain, you'd be very careful not to lose the papers. I hope the systems we're told are now in place will stop this happening again. And I agree with Councillor Weston, um, that we need to keep an eye on this going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd now like to call upon Councillor Khan to speak on behalf of the Liberal Democrat group. You have a three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. I think you may be on mute, Councillor, and you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. This is a small report with huge implications on people's lives. The report is a reminiscence of what we hear from our residents. I'm not surprised that how we uh, uh, drawn the comparison with other cities. Uh, it mentioned that we deal with six to 7,000 stage one and two cases. Out of that last year, it was only 140 and then 20 was only upheld. For me, one is too many and too much. In the Ombudsman report, the word mention, male administration. I know and heard that word many, many times in the context of developing world. And when I thought I wanted to have a look 
uh, uh, kind of bit keenly, what does it mean? I found um, in general, it means insufficient and dishonest administration. But when I looked into a bit deeper, I found it says delay, incorrect action, failure to take action, failure to follow procedures or laws, failure to provide information, inadequate record keeping, failure to investigate, failure to reply, misleading or inaccurate statements, inadequate liaison, inadequate consultation, broken promises. Only things he didn't mention is that the inflicts, how it inflicts the pains and distortions on, on people's life. And it's exposed council to legal challenges. It did mention when council was threatened with witness summons, then only information was provided. Imagine in some cases how councillors feels. I hope we'll learn the lessons. We must have staff that are trained and regularly coached to improve the patience to be listened to people's problems and deal with appropriately. Uh, thank you, my Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. The recommendation will now be shared on the screen. The recommendation is for full council to note the report. Thank you. Council notes the report. That concludes agenda item 10. There will now be an adjournment of 15 minutes. We will start back again at uh, 7.35. So if you please can return promptly. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you and welcome back. At this point in the meeting, we suspect the motion, the motions item will likely to run past the 30 minute allowed within the constitution. Therefore, please can I move a motion to extend the time of the meeting to 45 minutes. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. And all those against say no. Thank you very much. It's carried. So we will take 45 minutes for this, um, this part of the agenda for the motions. Thank you. I would now like to move to agenda item 11, the golden motion excluded UK. The motion will now be shared on the screen. The motion can be found on the website published as part of the agenda. Because this motion is very long and complex, I would like to leave it on the screen so that members of the public get an opportunity to read it. So, Councillor Shah, I'm not being rude, but I was going to ask you to speak as the mover of the motion while the motion is still upon the screen. So you have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Three million people from all walks of life have fallen through the gaps of this government's financial support schemes without, uh, throughout the pandemic due to technicalities in how they make a living. Director of small limited companies, self-employed people who make less than half their income through self-employment, employees of, umbre of, of umbrella companies, um, people who have recently changed jobs or become self-employed, freelancers, I could go on are simply ineligible for furlough and the self-employment grants and subsequently have had little to no financial support whatsoever um, over the last 10 months. The Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, uh, promised to do whatever it takes to support the people and businesses throughout this extraordinarily difficult period. This simply has not been the case, unfortunately. Um, there are 6,000 self-employed people in Bristol alone uh, that are ineligible for the self-employment um, income support scheme. Uh, if you count the other forms of, uh, of uh, excluded people, of excluded small businesses, this number is likely to be much, much higher. Uh, I appreciate that um, when faced with these kind of statistics, it can mean that people sometimes have the tendency to actually forget that behind every one of these uh, numbers is, uh, you know, represents people uh, who have a story you know, of uh, struggle to feed their family, to pay their bills, to pay their rent. We know there's a cost of living crisis um, and it's affecting blue and white collar um, uh, workers um, and salaried employees, the self-employed have all, all been neglected by this government sadly. And I've been personally contacted by a number of uh, affected residents and I'd like to briefly share uh, some of their stories. So Tom um, is a new chef at a local pub and also the owner of a small catering firm. He was um, eligible for the furlough scheme and was forced into borrowing from friends and actually had, he had to pawn personal valuables just to pay his bills. A single parent, uh, his income has been absolutely decimated and he's struggling to pay his mortgage. Um, and just take a moment to actually think about the difficulty that, that such people are facing. I've also Hensley, heard from you have Alex, 30 seconds left. A, a graphic designer who was eligible for uh, self-employment support due to technicalities and also supply teachers uh, through furlough. Um, excluded UK grassroots organisations have been provided uh, an invaluable service to those people, offering support and applying political pressure on their behalf. It's so right that we lend our support to the organisation's efforts uh, and support its efforts for party justice. So, um, we've got at least another month of lockdown. Uh, Can you draw left, to a close now, please? Optimistic. You've run out of time. And Thank these you. Gaps should really be fixed last March. My Lord Mayor, I'll, I'll just wrap up. But it's not too late for the government to do the right thing and help the excluded. Uh, so I call upon uh, each and every member to please support this motion. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Thank you. I would now like to call upon Councillor Johnson to speak on behalf of the Labour Group to second the motion. You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. 
When writing speeches, I usually like to start with something positive. This has made this speech particularly difficult. Instead, the words of Michael Jackson's song keep running through my mind, because all I want to say is that they don't really care about us. Another national lockdown until at least mid-February. It makes it vital that Bristolians receive appropriate financial support, period. The jobs retention scheme and the self-employment income support scheme have provided lifelines. However, these schemes are full of gaps, leaving some with zero financial support while simultaneously being instructed to stay at home. People who are legally prohibited from going to work should be supported by the government. Three million people across the UK have families who have lost all sources of income. It's so easy to say the words, three million people. But these are not just numbers. They're not just stats, they are real people. Bizarrely, Rishi Sunak is quoted as saying, no one will be left without hope. Hmm, so what's needed? Well, how about parity or equanimity? the same support that every other section of society is receiving. They are, after all, taxpayers. They are not asking for special treatments or handouts. They're asking for equality from a system which they've already paid into. How can any chancellor expect anyone to exist on zero income? The chancellor has referred to the universal credit as being an option for the excluded. But some of these people aren't even eligible for that. And even if they are eligible, many would struggle to pay the rents in some of our Bristol wards, let alone feed their families. If the government can find money to find to pay for half price Nando's, then I am sure that they can find money to help people in desperate need. At least 12 billion has been spent on a failed track and trace system. The money's there, but the government doesn't want to spend it. We, the Labour Party, are standing with you to make sure that you are heard and most importantly, that you are included. I'm pleased that Mayor Rees is listening to your accounts and that the All Party Parliamentary Group has members from every political party represented in Westminster. You As have 20 seconds left, Councillor. Thank you. We should have one last push to get justice for all of these people who have so unfairly been excluded. This is about doing the right thing. It's still not too late, so let's do it. Thank you. We will now hear from the speakers on the motion. I would now like to call upon Councillor Smith to speak on behalf of the Conservative group. You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Uh, I'll start by saying that the Conservative group is supporting this motion tonight. Um, and I'd like to, to thank Councillor Shah for uh, the way that he presented this and brought it to Council and resisted the temptation to turn it into a uh, political bash the Tories session. I think it, it benefits us all when we can debate an issue in a civilised way. Um, and I'm grateful that we have the opportunity to do that tonight and not try and not lump out of each other. Um, I should, at this stage, de declare a bit of an interest in, in informally, I think, that I am one of those three million excluded people. I, I set up a, a new business, my first, as, as a self-employed person in September 2019, little knowing, like all of us, what was about to come around the corner uh, and hit us all. Um, fortunately, I got lucky, and it was no more than sheer dumb luck that I ended up in a, a long-term contract with a COVID-proof client for the majority of, of the first lockdown and, and the sector I work in has since recovered. I've lost a little bit of income, but I've done okay, I'm fine. It could, a slight tweak in the facts, and I could have well have been in the same situation uh, as Councillor Shah's uh, residents that we've heard about. So I, I have huge sympathy for for people who are have been, been less, less lucky than I've managed to be. Um, I think we should recognise though, and, and you'd expect me to say that the government has provided unprecedented support to the economy, including to Bristol. Um, over the last nine months, our economy has taken the biggest hit that it's taken for centuries. Um, and the government has responded. There are gaps, but it has responded and responded strongly. In Bristol, we have received, I've got the figures in front of me, 687 
million pounds worth of government support. That includes, to take some highlights, 81 million of grants that have come straight to the council, 90 million in furlough and self-employment payments, another 90 in grants to small business, hospitality, leisure, um, and, and the list goes on. So I don't think we should take from this that the government isn't trying to do its bit, isn't, or, you know, it is somehow uncaring or ungenerous, but there are gaps and, and it is right they need to be filled. I can understand back in March, April last year, that the Treasury was running full speed to try and get these schemes out in time and went for the low hanging fruit. And that was probably a sensible thing to do. It's simpler and more straightforward to provide support for certain groups of people, the employed and, and some self-employed people where it's you easier. You have 30 seconds left. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, but it's not impossible to fill these gaps and nine months on, they do need to be filled. The Conservative group has already written both to the Chancellor of the Exchequer and to local Conservative MPs to raise this. And I hope that other groups will, will follow suit as the motion suggests. So we're supporting this motion tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to call upon Councillor Denier to speak on behalf of the Green Group. You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. The Green Party fully supports this motion. There are so many holes in the government support for both individuals and businesses during this pandemic. And I think what many people have found mystifying is that some of these holes don't seem to be the result of any ideological difference between the Conservatives and the rest of the population on who deserves support. They just seem to be where the government has forgotten about an entire industry or category of worker. The first one I heard about is the loophole in employee furlough, which left workers who'd started new jobs in spring 2020 without any support because of an arbitrary start date for eligibility, which irrationally penalised new starters. As young people tend to change jobs more often, and I represent a ward with a lot of students and recent graduates living here, this affected a number of people in my ward and there was nothing I could do to help them. To make matters worse, the government claimed to have fixed this a few months later, but incredibly, they still hadn't. Their fix required people to have received their per first pay slip by the time the lockdown started, rather than to have actually started a new job by then. But the majority of workers receive their first pay slip at the end of the month's work, of course. Apparently, the Conservatives are so disconnected from people who work ordinary jobs for a living that that didn't even occur to them. Another, frankly, stupid mistake the government made was to miss out English language schools. This is the kind of school where students from another country seeking to improve their English visit the UK for a few weeks or months, staying in a hostel or with local families while attending English lessons and cultural activities in the country. Bristol has a lot of these schools. Clearly, that business model was going to be rendered completely impossible when most international travel was stopped, the lockdown was introduced and cultural venues were closed. The government gave substantial support to the tourism and le leisure industries, but failed to notice that English language schools were affected in exactly the same way. These are just two examples among many where the government has arbitrarily refused or failed to support certain sections of society through this pandemic. So the Excluded UK campaign has my complete support. Our party group leader will write to the Chancellor and we support the Mayor in writing to the Government and Bristol MPs. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd now like to call upon Councillor Hopkins to speak on behalf of the Liberal Democrat group. You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Let's be clear, many have been excluded and our party has been vigorous in raising specifics with Government. And one of the tragedies is that Quite a lot of the people who've been excluded, it's comparatively small amounts of money in the scale of things, but it can have such devastating effects. And, and really, I think that, uh, as was said by uh, Carla, it, it hasn't been ideological quite so much from, from the Conservatives. Uh, having said that, the speed and the size of the financial response at the time uh, was, has been far better than other government actions on COVID. So comparing with TTI as an example, uh, the, re the response was in terms of scale and speed was actually, you know, reasonable under the circumstances. Uh, but we, we, we couldn't possibly expect things to be done perfectly. But uh, there are bound to be people in areas overlooked. And the problem is that the reviews have not been effective. 
we, we couldn't really expect government to get it absolutely right straight away back March when, when everything was in a panic and everything was all over the place. But as things moved on and these anomalies were brought up, we should have actually expected that things actually were addressed. One area that we, we as a party have actually raised concerns about is that um, <laughs> there seems to have been propping up of some offshore companies that don't pay tax in this country. Uh, and th that, that's been quite concerning, considering that some people who do work hard and have always paid their tax in this country have been excluded from, the, uh, from support. And, you know, some very large amounts of money have gone disappearing, uh, which we will not see coming back. Uh, I, I think, really, it's up to the City Council to try uh, to actually fill in some of these minor gaps. Now, I know we're going to hear, you know, we haven't got any money, but uh, there would be rather a lot more money available if there hadn't been £50 million wasted on Bristol Energy Company. And I make no apology for going back to that again, because not only was that a huge amount of Bristol City Council taxpayers' money wasted, it's been covered up. And basically all Labour members, when they bring up motions of this sort, should actually bear that in mind. Uh, £50 million... Pounds, protects quite a lot of small, lower income. You have 30 people. seconds, Councillor. Thank you. Right. And I also, the last point I wanted to make is that uh, I think it's, uh, you know, it, interesting to actually re ask party group leaders, opposition party group leaders, to write specific letters when <laughs> the, the, the Mayor and the Labour Party, to their eternal shame, actually boycott party group leaders. They'd be rather better informed and better teamwork players. Can you draw to a place now, please? Okay. Yes, certainly, Lorna. If they didn't actually boycott party group leaders and work with us more. Thank you. Councillor Shah, would you like to respond to the debate um, as the mover of the substantive motion? You have three minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Um, so despite what uh, Councillor Hopkins has, has just said, um, I actually do welcome the uh, unanimous cross-party support for this motion. Uh, and I think it's imperative that we all uh, do actually uh, write to central government and, and to ensure that, uh, that we do hold their feet to the fire in terms of uh, making sure that all those people who have been excluded um, deserve uh, actually receive the uh, financial support which they deserve. Um, and we're also very keen that uh, that we want to see Bristol emerge from this pandemic um, far stronger, uh, inclusive and certainly more sustainable. We can only do that um, if uh, if central government actually steps up too. Um, and I'd just like to make an observation here um, in terms of the uh, report uh, from the Office for National Statistics about Bristol. It's consistently rated as uh, one of the top cities uh, for uh, freelancers, for small business people, small and micro business people. Um, so there is a reason why um, a lot of uh, people who actually graduate in Bristol from UW and uh, University of Bristol end up staying here. Um, and we are known as a uh, city of enterprise, um, we're very outward looking as well. Um, so um, I, I think it's, it's essential uh, that, uh, that, that government uh, do offer that support. And I'd also like to take this opportunity, my Lord Mayor, just to, just to convey uh, my gratitude um, uh, towards Excluded UK uh, for all the work which they've done um, as, a, uh, as a voluntary group, um, and grassroots organization. And uh, once again, just thinking about all these people who really have suffered. Um, I know that uh, we've all had constituents write to us and um, just empathizing with what they've had to actually, um, what they've had to, to face. And when we talk about 6,000 people, the figure is probably far higher than that. That's not just 6,000 people, that's potentially 6,000 families. Um, but uh, certainly, um, I, I thank everybody for their support um, and uh, we look forward to the party leaders uh, joining uh, Mayor Mark to uh, write to Central asking for um, those people who have been excluded to uh, 
uh, receive financial support. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. I would now like to ask the Mayor if you would like to say a few words on this motion. You have three minutes, Mayor. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lord Mayor. And of course, this is actually um, about the businesses uh, that are being stressed uh, within the city. And I take um, uh, Steve's point um, earlier on, which is about um, putting aside any um, uh, any temptation there is to try and take chunks out of each other and focus on the challenge at hand. Um, this is very challenging, and, and again, this this is a this is a city issue, a regional issue, with, and, and I think actually in, in many ways here the the difference is more between the needs of leaders of places and what decisions are made in Westminster and Whitehall than it is between parties in a place, because the reality is the reality. Um, it was just a couple of weeks ago I was on a call with Andy Burnham, Steve Rotherham, um, Andy Street, West Midlands. Uh, Metro Mayor as well, uh, with Excluded UK and um, Steve and, and, and Andy um, had been uh, really uh, vocal on Excluded UK, but actually um, Andy Street uh, spoke as well and just said, actually, this is not OK. I will be speaking to the Chancellor myself because I'd had assurance. So it is uh, refreshing that as a city we can come together, on most of us can, and, and really focused on, on the challenge uh, that's at hand. We've been asking our finance team in, in responding to the financial announcements that are made to look not just at the implications for local government, for Bristol City Council finance, but actually the financial needs of the city. So taking into account the short, the difference between uh, what we think the existing schemes offer and what they provide, but also taking into account uh, the additional spending that would happen if those businesses excluded from the current support uh, schemes were actually included at, um, at the same level as those uh, that are in them. That is, and it's a challenging calculation, is how we get to that 21 and a half million uh, pound shortfall uh, that we're facing um, uh, each month. As I said, this is, this is uh, and Afsal has said, this is not just about businesses, it's not just about numbers on an Excel sheet. On the excluded UK call I was a part of, there were harrowing stories of uh, family breakdown, mental health, uh, depression, anxiety. Uh, one business owner from Clifton was talking about her child uh, stopped eating, started to engage in self-harm in the face of all the stress that the family uh, were under. Uh, and, and it's on that basis that in my conversations with government, we've been talking about the need to reframe the money, to reframe our understanding of the support packages. This is not spending in an abstract that goes down a black hole. This is an investment in well-being. It's an you investment. In making, left. Thank it's you. an investment in making sure there is something to grow the other side um, of this lockdown. If we don't take care of well-being, it will not only be a personal tragedy for those individuals and families, but it will turn up as a cost for our public services in the future that will no doubt roll down onto the shoulders of uh, local government. So it's great to stand together on this on behalf of Bristol. Thank you very much indeed. We will now move to the vote on the motion. Can I take it as agreed? Can I ask anybody who wishes to vote against if they can indicate now, please? I will wait a couple of moments just to make sure. There's nobody indicating that I can see. The motion is carried, thank you. I would now like to move on to the silver motion, energy efficiency support for every household in Bristol, making ideas work. The altered motion will now be shared on the screen. This motion has been altered, which means that all groups have agreed to a change, which in this case, was to change the date of the last sentence. The motion can also be found on the website published as part of the agenda. Thank you. Whilst it's on the screen again, just to give members of the public the opportunity to read through it, I would now like to call upon Councillor Negus of the Liberal Democrat Group to move the motion you have three minutes, councillor. Thank you. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Uh, this, th this motion starts and continues all the way through supporting Bristol City Council's environmental statements 
um, and its social concerns and its current actions. It's seeking to widen this out to all types of households by the council taking leadership of technical and financial guidance. It's looking to create a credible agency, mobilizing and upskilling initiatives all there in the motion that will attract support from government, public and commercial organizations. And this action and actions like these is already being undertaken in other councils across the United Kingdom. My background is in ideas and solutions and this motion, like most that I submit, seeks to resolve or improve what we do. But much as I'd like to, it's not telling the mayor what to do, so much as requesting that he gets his, uh, our officers to prepare recommendations for a way forward. If Bristol City Council can't be the best, we should certainly be as good as the rest. This motion is adding value, but it's also urging action. What we do today will be worth, worth more than next year, much more than in 2030, and massively more thereafter. Please support this uh, attempt to turn good words into real actions that will engage and benefit all our citizens. My Lord Mayor and Councillors, please don't let politics obstruct this genuine attempt to get Bristol City Council to make the time to inform, guide and act to lead this city through our climate crisis. But we don't have that much time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would now like to call upon Councillor Carey of the Liberal Democrat Group to second the motion. You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Um, we, uh, I, I would say I rise to second this motion. I don't. I'm sat down firmly. Um, yes, this is to, uh, as my colleague says, to try and put together some words which will initiate action that um you know if we are to meet our 2030 deadline nine years away we're not very far away from it now uh, we really do need to start getting positive we need to look principally though at where the advice comes from and i think there are plenty of agencies who will give that advice um but also where the funding will come from and there are plenty of places where you can get funding but uh, and, and at the moment, money is quite cheap. Mortgages are, believe it or not, cheap. Bristol City Council, amongst other local authorities uh, throughout the UK, has a system, and Bristol City Council is a little more expensive than, than some. Several national governments also have uh, policies, have ways um, of funding the private homeowner or the landlord to, to upgrade their properties. But then you ask, well, how do you, what, what system do you use? Um, yes, you can get a lot of wool and stuff and wrap it around your house and that will keep the house warm, but then you've got to get it warm. So how do you do that? You don't want to use a carbon uh, fuel. So you use electricity. Currently it's monstrously expensive compared to other fuel forms. So you look at, ways around this. You look at heat source, um, heat sources, uh, ground source, air source. Again, very expensive. Quick look today on the internet. You're looking at somewhere perhaps in the region of £15,000. To look at insulating walls, you're looking again at very large sums of money. And I live in a quite a small bungalow, a two bedroom bungalow. And I guesstimated today that my bill would be somewhere in the region of £50,000. We need to look how the local home owner, the private home owner, can actually afford this. I know at my age, I think, well, yes, it would be very nice if my home were insulated for that quality and if I could produce you have 30 energy seconds cheaply. left, Councillor. But, you know, one looks, is it worth it, you know, with, with the, the, the time I have left on this planet? 
Um, anyway, I hope so. And um, that's all I have to say. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. There has been an amendment from the Labour Group, which will now be shared on the screen. The amendment has been published online as a supplement to this meeting. Thank you. Um, again, because it's uh, long and quite complicated, the alterations, we'll leave it up on screen. And I would now like to ask Councillor Dudd of the Labour Group to move the amendment. You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Lord Mayor. And um, just want to say it's a, it's a shame that we've had to amend this motion, actually, because the obviously the subject matter has got uh, very significant merits to it. But unfortunately, reading the motion, it almost comes from a position of ignorance in terms of what the council, council is actually doing at the moment and what is available, already available to people at the moment. So that's the main reason that we're uh, amending this. It's obviously vitally important that we deal with the carbon, carbon emissions from buildings. Nobody's denying that. The biggest source of our CO2 emissions in Bristol, 40% of it is from the from meeting the need for, for heat. Um, and obviously it's, it's essential that we insulate homes to reduce the actual need for turning heating on in the first place. Um, and also uh, it's very important that we convert older buildings over to other sources of energy, such as heat pumps and newer buildings in the city, if we can't make them passive, then connecting them to systems like the district heating system that we're developing at the mo moment. All of this is set out in the One City Climate Strategy, which outlines the, the, the problem and what, what change is required. We've massively invested in energy infrastructure as an administration. Um, we're currently developing the biggest zero carbon water source heat pump in, in England. That will take waste heat from the docks. Um, and provide it to uh, businesses and residents that are connected to that system. So we're, you know, we're well up for, uh, for that, that sort of um, investment from the council. But what we really need is long-term, sustainable, reliable policy and investment from government. We don't really have that at the moment. The flagship uh, government policy at the moment, the Green Homes Grant, there's a cliff edge to that next March. But I would encourage residents to take up that, that uh, scheme if they can. Um, and we don't know what will replace that and what a replacement will look like to that scheme. So um, we have 30 seconds left. Thank you. It's been the case for several years in Bristol that we haven't had this certainty. That's why we've developed the City Leap Energy Programme. That's a live procurement exercise at the moment where we'll be looking to, uh, uh, to deal with the uh, installation of domestic and commercial properties and residential properties. There's already advice available from the Centre of Sustainable Energy. But we will look at the advice and offer and review that. I'm happy to do that to see if we can expand it. Um, and also, can you draw to a close now, please? Thank course, you. Yeah, just draw to a close. And the, the other issue we had is the date. Obviously, the City Leap uh, programme is a live procurement exercise. So reporting back on the progress of that will be difficult. So we won't be doing that until we've um, actually procured Can you really partner. draw to a close so now, I, please? So please, um, please support this uh, amendment. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to call upon Councillor Rippenton to second the amendment. You have a maximum of three <clears throat> minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I hope we can all acknowledge that the challenge of climate change is enormous and uh, it's something that can't be overcome by local government alone. Um, whilst we did, as a group, we did have a lot of sympathy with the sentiments of the, the original motion, we didn't think we could support it in its current form with no mention of the requirement for, for government to properly fund a revolution in energy performance uh, in order to meet carbon reduction targets across the UK. We also felt there was little recognition that a lot of the work being asked for is already underway within the city, as, as Kai has mentioned. Um, specifically, we already have energy advice services operated in Bristol by the Centre for Sustainable Energy and Bristol Tenants Energy Advice Centre. According to um, the recent report presented to People's Scrutiny, uh, the latter has saved Bristolians over £120,000 in the past year alone. Um, and the City Leap project, which is integral to achieving our climate change goals, is, is not mentioned in the original motion. Um, we do recognise that there is always more that can be done and also that people may not be aware of what is already underway. 
and we're therefore happy to request a report for council to explain the work being done by the City Leap project. But as Kai has said, there are um, time scale issues with that. Um, specifically, this needs to set out, I think, what is being done to support a wider range of households in Bristol to have access to green energy and to reduce their energy use to help Bristol become carbon neutral by 2030. Um, we're also happy to request a report into the exist existing advice services and funding schemes uh, for appropriate and tailored support to every household in the city uh, and consider options to increase capacity, uh, including the exploration of strategic partnerships uh, to provide the comprehensive service and offer that we agree is needed. We know that the mayor and indeed the Labour Party in all quarters will continue to push central government for the kind of funding which is required to bring about the revolution that we need in this area in order to meet both our own and national targets. Um, we think this amended motion covers both the need to explain better what we're doing and to investigate more what can be done. So it also recognises major you have 30 elements seconds of the left, councillor. Recognises that major elements of the solution are out of our hands and must be dealt with by government, uh, who now need to demonstrate that they fully recognise the very real threat that is posed by climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we now move to hear from the speakers on the motion. I'd now like to call upon Councillor Eddie to speak on behalf of the Conservative group. You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. My Lord Mayor, I would like to thank Councillor Negus for bringing this helpful motion. More energy efficient buildings have to be a key way of combating energy poverty and helping us beat the 2030 carbon neutral target. Councillor Negus is quite right in his original motion. Um, in that the current arrangements are piecemeal and must be improved. Whilst we are correct to be ambitious, we need to be, we need a well argued business plan and the financial obligations must be clearly set out. Although Tory councillors share Councillor Negus's concerns, we regret the more blatant Labour attacks shown by Councillor Doug's amendments. Accordingly, it is a shame that Labour has sacrificed a good cross-party amendment motion, which we would have otherwise supported. So reluctantly, we have to abstain on this. Thank you very much. I'd now like to call upon Councillor Fodor to speak on behalf of the Green Group. You have three minutes, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Greens want action to improve housing energy in our city. Energy efficiency in homes is vital to save carbon, tackle climate breakdown and end the scandal of fuel poverty. It helps the local economy too. The massive Green Jobs programme will be very welcome and it will save disposable income. We instigated the Climate Emergency Declaration and the 2030 deadline, and either of these versions of the motion would do, though both, I'm afraid, have shortcomings. Remember, we were briefed a year ago on the Centre of Sustainable Energy report that shows the staggering scale of the task to tackle our homes. The original motion was very determined, but says little about all the things already going on in the city that we need to build on, like warmer homes advice and money services, and the brilliant work done by community energy groups, like the award-winning cheese project that traces actual heat loss that needs to be tackled, green home open days, and the groups actively sharing advice and experience, even this week. The council has to work in partnership, so therefore, and the value of community energy champions and grants that the energy cooperative gives, and most recently, the Energy Network's crowdfunding emergency COVID fund that's offering vouchers right now. Please donate if you can. It's only got, um, you know, 7,000 to go to reach its target. The proposed amendment to the motion is briefer and it refers to City Leap, although, of course, that project isn't yet underway and we've no idea who will win from the shortlist. So it's not delivering any action yet. 
I, I don't know the use of another city loop report on what's not yet been decided, really. The author also confuses the work to cut council carbon emissions with housing emissions in the city, where things have been fitful for the decades I've worked in this field. We know the green home scheme is far from perfect, yet the task is enormous. So we do need to mobilise national government, national funding, local funding, and the pensions funding, of course, is essential. So letters and reports are not enough. We've been calling for climate jobs to retrofit homes for years. Like last year's Green Budget Amendment, it funded training council workforce in fitting energy saving technologies in council housing. But despite their words today, Labour voted down the proposal to spend the actual available capital on improving council houses. So we've still got work to do there. As the motion says, tackling privately rented properties. You have 30 seconds, councillor. Thank you. It's long overdue. So another of our budget amendments to enforce the minimum energy efficiency standards in private rents um, is frustratingly not implemented yet. We'd like action on that. Finally, we also need to work with residents. Both versions are silent on this. It's long been known that half the savings are made by working with people on how they live in their homes, setting controls, pulling curtains and so on. So as well as better ways... close now, please, Councillor? Thank you. Final sentence. So... We need more installation, but also energy literacy and how it makes sense to people who have other priorities and other pressures. So most Greens will vote Can for the amendment. Can you draw to a close, please? We are really tight yeah. for time, please. Yeah. Thank most you. Most will vote for both the amendment and the motion, but it's crucial the outcome isn't just reports, but action on energy loss in our homes. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I would now like to call upon Councillor Negus. Would you like to respond to the debate on the amendment as the mover of the altered substantive motion? You have three minutes. I'll just remind you at this time that we are quite short of time. So if you can keep to your time limit, please. Thank you. I'll do that. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I certainly regret not picking up some of the things that are being done in the city at the moment. And Martin's quite right to correct me on that. But I concentrated the most on what on what we needed to drive forward. And the, the small amount of work that we're doing in terms of energy advice for it will have to be increased by well over a thousand percent. I mean, probably more likely 10,000% uh, if we're to, to do this. So this is all small beer. We've got to upgrade. We've got to be serious about this. And that means pulling things together. I reached out to the uh, senior labor councillor to try and get this, the essence of this motion agreed uh, across uh, a cross party, but instead, uh, the last uh, the late last night, we got this amendment, which is basically a, a, a whitewash. It 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 just doesn't. Uh, uh, it takes out all of the elements of this. We, we know that it's not a wrecking amendment because <clears throat> the Labour Party backroom crew uh, uh, know how to make sure that they get they wipe everything out and keep to the to the right side of the line over this. But if, if, if it simply guts the, the essence of this, it takes out all the action, it, it, it removes all the urgent timescale, and it replaces uh, civic initiatives with the, with the obligatory uh, labour propaganda. This, this is not what the essence of this should be. We should be cooperating here for something which is so serious. We should not be trying to knock spots off each other. And if you won't cooperate, at least you could have hung back and let this go through and we'd all agree. But instead, you want to make a big point out of it and, and wash out all the important bits. I'm, I'm really sad about this. That, that you've taken this, that Labour have taken this line. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm disappointed that uh, you should feel the need to bring this amendment and wash away all the good points that were originally in this, uh, identifying all the shortcomings that we have at the moment. Not blaming this council, I'm not blaming the government, but by goodness, we've all got to work together with local money, local private individuals, landlords, everybody else to crack this problem and that means cooperation and working together and I don't see much of that and I'm disappointed. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move to the vote on the amendment. The vote on the amendment will be carried out as a named vote but in the form of a roll call. You are voting on the amendment and the names will be read out in alphabetical order by Tim O'Gara. If you can please 
be ready to answer because we obviously are very short of time. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Don Alexander. Four. Councillor Leslie Alexander. Abstain. Councillor Beach. Four. Councillor Bowden Jones. Four. Councillor Bradshaw. Four. Councillor Brain. Four. Councillor Bolton. Four. Councillor Brooke. Four. Councillor Brackles. Four. Councillor Carey. Against. Councillor Cheney. Four. Councillor Barry Clark. Four. Councillor Stephen Clark. Four. Councillor Clough. Against. Councillor Comley. Against. Councillor Craig. Four. Councillor Chris Davies. Against. Councillor Mike Davies. Four. Councillor Denya. Dane. Councillor Dud. Four. Councillor Eddie. Abstain. Councillor Fodor. Four. Councillor Godwin. Four. Councillor Goggin. Four. Councillor Gollop. Abstain. Councillor Gulandris. Abstain. Councillor Hans. Abstain. Councillor Hickman. M4. Councillor Hiscott. Abstain. Councillor Holland. Four. Councillor Hopkins. Councillor Hopkins. Councillor Jackson. Councillor Jammer. Four. Councillor Johnson. Four. Councillor Jones. Abstain. Councillor Keane. Four. Councillor Kent. Against. Councillor Khan. Councillor Kirk. Four. Councillor Lake. Four. Councillor Lovell. Four. Councillor Massey. Four. Councillor Malias. Abstain. Councillor Morris. Abstain. Councillor Negus. Against. Councillor O'Rourke. Four. Councillor Pierce. Four. Councillor Phipps. Four. Councillor Pickersgill. Four. Councillor Quarterly. Abstain. Councillor Radford. Abstain. Councillor Rippington. Four. Councillor Sargent. Four. Councillor Shah. Four. Councillor Smith. Abstain. Councillor Stevens. Four. Councillor Thomas. Four. Councillor Threlfall. Four. Councillor Tinknell. Four. Councillor Wellington. Four. Councillor Weston. Stain. Councillor Whittle. Four. Councillor Windows. Stain. Councillor Wright. Mayor Reese. Against. No, I'm for. I think there was a delayed uh, response there from someone. <laughs> I think it was Councillor Wright being again. Yes, please. Um, Councillor Wright. Again. Thank you. Um. Councillor Khan. Councillor Jackson. Four. Councillor Hopkins. Against. I think that's everyone, Lord Mayor. So the results are uh, 
41 for, 8 against and 15 abstentions. So the amendment is carried. In order to have time to hear this item, it has been agreed to move straight to a vote on the motion now on the table. Before we do that, Councillor Negus, would you like to respond to the debate on the amendment as the mover of this altered substantive motion? I, I says here we got three minutes, but we really don't have three minutes. Thank you. I'll do it in one. I, I just wanted to say with, with just a few motions allowed by Labour uh, uh, to the opposition parties, it's atrocious that they feel they have to control even those. I, I tried to help, but I'm not voting for this bleached out uh, uh, amended motion. It's It's been bad for free thinking tonight and a sad waste of time. This does no favours for the controlling Labour administration and sadly some of the more open-minded uh, some of their more open-minded councillors um, so yes let, let's let, let's let's leave it now um, uh, we'll uh, leave the meeting and switch off thank you thank you very much uh, we will now move to a vote on the motion upon the table um, now we have two options. Uh, we could go to a named vote. We have asked the whips if they would go to uh, implied consent. Uh, we haven't had a response back. If we go for a named vote, we are going to have to extend the time for another, I would suggest, 10 minutes so that we can do it comfortably. Can we not block vote, my Lord Mayor? We can do Im uh, comply implied consent. Implied if you're consent. Happy, or if you're happy with yes. that. Let, let, let's go with implied consent, please. Agree with that, Lord Mayor. Can I just thank you very much. Uh, the Green is Fee Hans, Councillor Sorry, Hans. Sorry, that's okay. Everyone else has implied okay. consent. Okay. So if we can move to implied consent, uh, the motion upon the table, <coughs> can I ask if we have anybody who disagrees, if they can indicate now, please? Thank you. Um, if you can raise a blue hand or indicate, so we've got Councillor Weston, Councillor Negus, Councillor Hopkins, Councillor uh, Chris Davis, Councillor Eddie. Do we have any others? Councillor Steve Smith. Um, I'm just looking to see if I can see anybody else in front of Councillor me. Councillor Carey. Councillor Carey, thank you. Councillor Kent. Councillor Kent. Gosh. Councillor here, Scott. Councillor Steve Scott. Jones. Oh, Councillor gosh, Gallandris. Wow. Um, Councillor Galandris, Councillor Steve Jones, I think we've got that. Is there anybody else who I can't see who's indicated? Chris Councillor Windows. Councillor Bollard. Bollard. Sorry, hang on. Councillor, Councillor Radford. Radford. Hang on, right. If you can raise your hand. So it's Councillor Gollop, Councillor Windows, Councillor Radford. I think we're there as far as Councillor I can Morris. see. Councillor, Councillor Morris. Morris. Councillor Millas. Councillor Portley. OK, so we've got Councillor Morris, Councillor Malias. Councillor Clough. Right. Um, I tell you, I, I, actually, this is getting a bit tricky. <laughs> My Lord it, Mayor, if I me, may. Sorry, can I get some clarity, just, just, just a freeze? Am I getting the impression that the Conservative group are voting against on, on block? We're abstaining on block. Abstain, abstaining on block. Thank you very much. And can I ask about the Lib Dem group? Are they mm -hmm. voting against? Or... Lord Mayor, Lord Mayor, the Liberal Democrat group is abstaining on block. Thank you very much. OK, so we've got some clarity on that. Can I ask if there's anybody else who is either voting or abstaining? And that would be from the, uh, the Labour group and the Green group. Um, the Labour group that... is in favour on block. Thank you very much, uh, mm. Councillor Jackson. Councillor Hans, can I ask if you have any councillors who you know are abstaining or voting against? Alas, I do not. We don't have a block vote. I'm sorry to stymie things for you, Lord Mayor, but um, I, th I think we might have a mixed bag, but I can't be sure. OK, well, nobody's indicated thus far. So, OK, um, I think we have some clarity. We will just check the numbers just to make sure. So just bear with me a minute. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. We have it. Um, so we have 44 voted in favour and 21 people abstained. So the motion is carried. I'm sorry about that. It was slightly messy. We live and learn. So that brings the meeting to an end. Thank you very much indeed for all councillors attending this evening. The next meeting of full council is the budget full council meeting on the 23rd of February 2021, starting at two o'clock.